Hello again, everyone, and welcome back to Dragon Lake. Here we meet Varam as he's about to step through that fog gate and do his best impression of Final Fantasy X. That's right, it's time to take on Sin, so prepare your fake laugh and your blitz balls, and let's get to it. Gonna wanna buff up as much as I can. Gonna have the bright bug, just checking my rings. The bright bug is actually really helpful in this encounter, but I'm still worried that it might not be enough. The bright bug actually increases the damage you deal by an extremely loud, extremely large margin. I think it's something around 40%, as well as decreasing the damage you take by another very good amount. Possibly the worst thing about this encounter is that I'm wearing armor, and that is actually a terrible disadvantage since we have this very strong, very fast dragon in front of me who really isn't going to care what kind of armor I'm wearing and is really just going to tear through me like I'm made of paper no matter what I'm playing at. Ooh, turns out I can't roll through that. I'm going to have to use a jumping roll in order to avoid that. Make sure he doesn't come down on me. That's one of the very dangerous things about these dragons every part of their body hurts. It's not like most enemies where you can just avoid their attacks. You actually have to avoid everything about him. Come on, run. Ah, can't hit that wing. I do get to clip him on the lift off, but this is a very tense fight. It's all about just keeping your distance, making sure to dodge out of all of his attacks, and there will be... Oh! There will be a lot of incoming attacks, trust me. Sin does not relent. Luckily, you can actually just assume the giant castration position and kind of go to town on him from beneath, as you can with so many other really large bosses. Though, he will start toxicing up the entire arena, which can really put a damper on your chances of success. Especially because he doesn't really give you that many chances to damage him if you're playing a melee class. Really, the only time you have to get some real damage off on him is when he's on the ground like this. If he's really nice, he will use that fire-breathing attack that is just free time to be swinging away. I like to have this fight fairly under wraps, but now's when it gets really tense because the bright bug has worn off, so I have, I'm taking increased damage from him. Brightbug is an incredibly useful buff, but it's extremely limited as well. Oh, that was a bad, bad situation. Hopefully I can double Estus. I can. He's going to breathe fire. Which means I come in and get the free damage. One more, one more, one more. Come on, don't move. Oh, come on. There we go. Sin is down. I was really worried about that fight because I'd had extreme difficulty on it my first time through. But I think that was more from an unfamiliarity with his moveset. Sin is very reminiscent of Kalamit, but it, I'm, I'm, I'm going to come out and say it. He's actually an improved version. He's one of the best bosses in the entirety of Dark Souls 2, and one of the best reasons for picking up the DLC. This has been our full clear of it, but I want to take a second just to talk about Sin. He is such a great boss because he's an incredibly difficult encounter, but for all the right reasons. He's got a very difficult moveset, he's very unpredictable, he lays down big AoEs, he's very difficult to dodge. But once you have his patterns down, you can move around the boss fight, you can take a chance to heal when he's stuck in a certain animation, you, you can play the encounter. Whereas... Some of the other bosses, it's, it's very systematic. It's not dynamic. Take, for instance, the Ancient Dragon at the end of the base game. It's nowhere near as energetic as this fight. As I was saying a bit earlier, it's also very reminiscent of Kalamit in that... Oh, do I have all these souls? I believe I actually have all of the great souls, so I can head on through the King's Door after spending some level ups. But... Sin is extremely reminiscent of Calamite in how his boss fight plays out. You've got a dragon flying around everywhere, giving you very few opportunities for damage, but I think they really fixed the fight, whereas Calamite was a massive damage sponge that took forever to chop through. 
Sin, as you saw right there, wasn't incredibly strong as far as health goes, but he did incredible amounts of damage, and when he struck, he struck hard and fast, whereas Calamite was this great big lumbering dragon that took forever to make a movement, and even when he did, it was fairly easy to see what was coming and roll out. Calamite not only drags your camera left and right, he's constantly moving about around the boss fight room, he's constantly swinging and even laying down environmental hazards, while Calamite just kinda stood there, used a certain attack, waited for you to respond to that, then started up again. It, it was very slow, very methodical boss fight, whereas Sin is an incredibly energetic boss fight. You're always running, you're always low on stamina, you're always trying to get off some more damage. Occasionally he'll play nice and use his forward fire breathing attack, but other times he'll just be the absolute dickens, especially if you're in melee combat. He has a tendency to just fly away and start carpet bombing you with his toxic fire. And even worse, he actually has a bit of a corrosive element to his fight, so you may have to bring in multiple weapons in order to make it through the fight with a legitimate amount of damage because your weapons are going to break if you stick at fighting him for any length of time. That really adds an entirely new dynamic to the fight where you can't just get used to this one weapon and it's one moveset. If your weapon breaks, you have to change out or you're done. You're a goner. Singe is just such a very dynamic fight because it's always moving around, it's always changing, it's not all about memorizing a specific pattern and really just abusing the AI and making sure you're always playing safe. There is no safety. You can avoid dam the damage from every single one of Sin's attacks, but it's difficult. They make you work for it. It's not like it is with Calamite, where it's more of a... or even the Ancient Dragon. I think that Sin is the best dragon fight, because it's not a slog through a massive health bar. But it is extremely punishing. The Ancient Dragon is punishing in a bad way, in that it's just really a boring fight because it's a one-shot death mechanic that's, that tends to make any fight extremely boring, especially when it's a matter of the boss having so much health that you just have to keep hacking away for quite some time in order to finally put the old beast down, all the while just abusing his pattern of fly up, burn, come back down, breathe forward, fly up, burn, breathe down, come back down, etc. With Sin, it, it really engages you in the fight. You're constantly thinking about where's the boss headed? How can I get around that? Where should I be running to? Should I waste the stamina? Do I have enough to make a jumping roll? There's always something you can be doing. There's always something to be done in the fight. Whereas with Calamite and the Ancient Dragon, it's, it's very much just wait until the boss gets locked into an animation, get some damage off, play, back off, play it safe, Wait for the boss to get locked into an animation, rinse, repeat, over and over and over again. And so that's why I really think that Sin is one of the best things to happen to Dark Souls 2. It just fixed so many of the problems that Dark Souls 2 had had. Especially because Dark Souls 2's boss fights have been extremely uh, bland, very unmemorable, very little really you can say about them. Whereas... Sin just broke that trend to pieces and gave us one of the best fights we've had in Dark Souls ever. There were some that... <laughs> I'm not going to say that all of the boss fights in Dark Souls 2 were bad, especially because we all know how much I love the Lost Sinner, and there are a few other fights that are really great, like Dark Lurker, but honestly, Sin raised the bar. Sin is what I expected from FromSoft. I wanted something bombastic, something huge, sweeping it over the top, and Sin delivered on so many levels. It was... Sin is the dragon fight that every video game wishes they had. A, a fight where the dragon is playing smart, the dragon's at the top of its game, it's trying to fly away, it's getting range damage whenever possible, sometimes it's coming in to crush you, but really, the player feels threatened. This is a dragon. They are playing with fire, and they are about to get burned if they don't move out of the way as fast as they bloody can. Sin is not your Skyrim dragon that 
dies after you plank it full of arrows. Sin is not your dragon from any other RPG. RPGs have just taken what dragons used to be, or, or at least most video game dragons. They've taken what dragons used to be and really brought them down to a sort of mortal level. And it's nice to have a boss fight, a dragon fight, every now and again that really shows you, no, this is, this is something that is on an entirely other level. Like, a few other games that do that really well are, I've heard, Monster Hunter, and I know for a fact that Dragon's Dogma has some incredible dragon fights, but... This is this is Souls and Sin is the best dragon fight we've ever had in any of the Souls games. And we have had quite a few. And most of them have just been slogs through massive health bars, and that's been a little bit of a disappointment to anyone who really likes the whole dragon motif, but doesn't necessarily like that mechanic of just make the health bar massive and make it incredibly repetitive. Like even go the the trend was started all the way back in Demon Souls with the uh, drakes that guarded the Boletarian castle once the demon plague had come in. The red drake was just a matter of shooting it a bunch of times with wooden arrows when it came in to bomb the bridge, and the blue drake was just a matter of sitting beneath it and constantly planking away, preferably in hyper mode, with the strongest arrows you could get your hands on. Neither of them were interesting fights. It was just simply rinse and repeat and you'll kill the dragon. And that's that's not fun. That's not engaging. Calamy was where they first really started to understand what we wanted from a boss fight. Calamy was a very bombastic and very larger-than-life fight. But he didn't really... He didn't really give you the dynamic feel. It felt very scripted, like... No matter what you were doing, Calamy would come back with a singular move, and you could always avoid it very, very easily. That's the thing about Calamy, is that he wasn't uh, an incredibly difficult boss, but he did lots of damage, and he had lots of health. And especially if you wanted his tail, because by golly, I wanted his tail. Even if I was never going to use his tail on that playthrough, I wanted his tail every single time just because it has the capacity to be the strongest gouge weapon that deals purely physical damage. A weapon with no scaling that breaks the 400 attack point barrier with, without any sorts of raw upgrade, that was a weapon to have back in Dark Souls 1. That was a really fancy weapon, especially because it could be enchanted after that. There were almost no weapons that, especially really powerful boss type weapons that could be enchanted and it was one of them so that really made it stand out not only for its lack of necessary scaling but just for the fact that it was one of the weapons that you could get that was going to be able to take advantage of hidden weapon a very fun sorcery for pvp which allowed you to whatchamacallit completely hide your weapon they brought it back but uh it's worthy to note because it also had a special AoE move that allowed it to create a massive burn of black fire around the caster for a good chunk of durability, but if you had the weapon cloaked by hidden weapon, then the enemy couldn't see you charging up the AoE, and so you had a much, much better chance of landing it. It was one of the best combos in the game, at least for trolling or having fun in PvP, and that really made it a fun weapon that I wanted to get whenever I had the chance. And again, I didn't manage to actually spend all too much time using it, but I still have really fond memories of it, and that's one of the other criticisms that there is in Dark Souls 2, is that there are no boss cut, tail cuts. And while I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. I, I'm gonna, I, I at least lean on the side of calling it a bad thing, because those were a fun and interesting element to boss fights that gave you a bit of a reward if you had the chops to beat it in a certain fashion. If you had the chops to not only kill the boss, but kill it by hacking away at its tail, yeah, you deserve a little something extra. And they were gonna give it to you. Most of the tail weapons were rubbish, but 
you wanted them anyways because they were more than just a silly weapon. They were kind of a badge of honor for the fight. They were like, I beat this boss, but I beat it hard. I beat it so well that I could manage to spend most of the boss fight behind it just hacking away. I remember Seat's tail cut was the absolute dickens in the first game just because he had those really sweeping AoE attacks and if you stood behind it for any period of time he would start swinging his tails around which not only made them almost impossible to hit accurately but also uh, basically turned the entire area behind him into a zone of death where if you, you crossed into that section you were basically going to get thwomped by one of his thrashing appendages and boy were there a lot of them that's another thing about uh, Sin that really harkens back to Dark Souls 1 is that the boss design in general, just the massive dragon with a spear sticking right through his chest, like good lord, that's so cool. I mean, it's an overused saying, but that's frickin' metal. That is really badass. And most of the bosses in Dark Souls 2 aren't badass. They're just kind of there. And that's one of the best things about Sin, and the whole DLC really, is that a lot of the boss fights are really cool and really interesting and new. The DLC is one of the best things to happen to Dark Souls 2. Dark Souls 2 provided a really great base for the DLC, in that it gave us wonderful new combat systems, much tighter controls, better weapon variety, and all that wonderful stuff. And now I think that they've taken some time, gone back through, and are sorting out the problems that they had with some of the story, the lore, the boss fights, the level design, all those gripes that we had about Dark Souls 2 when it first came out, now they're being addressed, and while I can't be certain, it really feels like the DLC is a love letter to the fans. It's, it's everything we asked for and more. Sure, they added a few little cheap elements here and there, but what we gained in return is just so utterly worthwhile. I, I cannot gush enough about how good the Dark Souls 2 DLC is. This Crown of the Sunken King has been absolutely fantastic. I've just finished it up in front of you all, and y you saw all the wonderful new mechanics that they introduced. There's the uh, Corpse Ghost Hollows. The they brought new sorcerers in. They gave you a counter to Profound Still, which can just wreck casters. If I know I didn't actually manage to grab it, but the caster-type enemies that showed up in the DLC actually have a chance of dropping their headpiece, which will make it so that Profound Still no longer silences you at the cost of lowering your attunement. It... Uh, I, I really cannot say enough about the DLC. There's so much that they fixed, so much that they did right, that I am I really am just so glad it's here. I cannot wait for the next ones. I already have the uh, season pass, so I'm just going to get those as soon as they come out. And really, I have high hopes for them, given what I've already seen from the DLCs. Hopefully, they'll also give you a little bit more of an explanation as to what the whole crown motif is about, as well as perhaps tie up the little bits of exposition that they drop you once you've gathered the Ashen Mist Heart. Once again, I'm not going to spoil that just because I haven't gotten to it in this playthrough, and you maybe don't know about that just yet, especially because as I'm playing this, the DLC is still fairly new. It hasn't been out for more than a month, probably a b only a few weeks. And so, it, there really is a high chance that plenty of people may not really have seen the whole thing just yet, or don't know the story. <laughs> it's kind of silly coming back to Drang Lake after spending all that time in Shulva. These enemies are just not prepared to do... Normally there's an enemy there. I think it may have fallen off at one point, but... This axe is just tearing its way through, and I believe the Titanite Lizard out front actually gave me the Titanite I'm going to need to get the Blacksmith's Hammer to plus 10, and as you can see, I was having good fun using that against the uh, really armored 
sentinels and stone warriors that were hiding in that one room. So I'm really looking forward to using that a little bit more often now that it's not just an inferior weapon. I've been especially getting used to its moveset because in my one of my other playthroughs I'm running a soul level 1 character and turns out the mace is almost the perfect weapon for that challenge. You only are given 6 strength to work with and 6 dexterity. I'm just trying to loot that. And so the mace is perfect because it only takes 12 strength and 5 5 or 6 dexterity. I believe it's 5. But because you can two-hand it, it actually gives you the perfect amount of strength to wield it effectively. And as I've already told you, and as you've probably seen, the two-handed mace is one of my favorite movesets in the game, especially for dealing with large single enemies like bosses. So I've just been having a field day clearing through. It was not nearly as difficult as I was expecting. Depending upon which boss I was facing, I was actually having much better luck than I was in most of my playthroughs. Especially because I've got a fair stack of bright bugs because I don't really have anything else to spend my souls on, so it's just been a matter of using bright bugs for any boss fight that would be normally kind of difficult. Oh, excuse me. It turned the smelter demon into an absolute breeze. I was really expecting to have a very harrowing time with that. Especially because the smelter demon is one of my weakest bosses just on any playthrough. But, no, the Bright Bug managed to get me the win the absolute first try. The only difficulties I really have with that character is adapting to the uh, crap agility. Because since you can't level up, you're working with base agility the entire time, so that's all those iframes that you just do not have. If you're not playing a ranged character, you want to just focus one Dragon Rider at a time, whichever one is really available to you. Preferably the silvered one, this the archer one. I don't know why they have different armor, but it has much, much lower defenses and health, so you can just cleave through him in a matter of moments, and once either of them's alone, it's, it's just the dragon rider again, so there's no real <laughs> challenge there. There's, there's no way you're gonna die there unless you've you're fairly new to the Souls games. When they're together, I'll admit, they have a chance to kind of stagger lock you, or if you're not paying attention, you can start taking damage from one while you're paying attention to the other one, but a single Dragon Rider is not enough to kill anybody who's used to the Souls games. It's just a matter of fact. The, the Dragon Riders are not difficult enemies. I was actually surprised, because when I faced the Dragon Rider for the first time, it kind of felt like a Capper Demon fight in that it felt like a boss that I was going to be seeing a lot more of as time went on. Maybe late game he kind of turns into a regular enemy, but that wasn't the case. So I guess they didn't really feel like adding that in there. Talking through all of Nashandra's dialogues actually allows you to see exactly how many bonfires are where, and it allows you to sort of count off the ones you've missed. As you can see, I haven't unlocked Strayed, the Belfry, uh, Undead Purgatory, let's see, and, oh, did I not? Oh, goodness, I, I apparently forgot to head down into the basement of Dragon Lake Castle, but I can head back there any other time. I believe I've talked with Grandall in both locations, so I'll, I'll do that when I'm ready to face Dark Lurker proper, but not right now. Right now we're heading right on through to Amana as fast as we bloody can in order to get my Red Iron Twin Blade. I'm really looking forward to finally picking up that last weapon of the playthrough. Let's see. I've almost got enough chunks to upgrade it straight to plus 10, so I'm really looking forward to having that. Once I have that, the theme build will be complete and I can sort of rest on my laurels with the build really at its peak efficiency. As you've been seeing, I've been upgrading my strength a little bit just to squeeze that little bit more damage out of all the wonderful strength scaling that all these weapons have. The 
BB scaling that I have, and I believe that the Red Iron Twin Blade will actually go all the way to plus A, but I can't quite recall. All I know for certain is that its base damage was... Oh yeah, look at that blunt damage. Almost... Almost a full health bar in a single swing. Can I get it? No, I can't get it. But the Red Iron Twin Blade's base damage was buffed by a full 70 at max rank in the patch, so it's going to be extremely powerful. Once you've gotten him to move, you pretty much can just homeward bone out if you don't want to clear through the rest of the level, but look who you're talking to. I, I Of course I'm going to clear through the rest of the level. I want every single little bit of loot here that I can grab, and believe me, there's a lot for me to grab. Thinking about it, I might actually consider not only grabbing the uh, armor that's down in the basement of Drang Lake Castle, but also switching to it from time to time, depending upon which weapon set I'm using. The Red Iron Twin Blade, and if I decide to, the Red Rust weapons are definitely going to go with the Vengarl's set, but I may actually want to use the Faram armor that's available down in the basement of Drang Lake Castle, just because not only is the Bandit Axe actually from Ferosa, Land of the Lion Knights, that we can actually grab the armor of down there at the basement, but also these seem like more metallic weapons, whereas uh, Vengarl's set, as you can see, has a very red, bloody, rusted look to it, which is why he has the red rust sword and scimitar, as well as the red iron twin blade, which, while technically completely unrelated, I, I think it just fits so perfectly. Just seeing if... Yeah, that, that actually may create some issues with my weight capacity, but I think that if I just focus on wielding the red iron twin blade while wearing Vengarl's set and wielding the other two metallic weapons while wearing the Faram set, that that might actually solve the problems that I'm thinking about. Might cut down on my weight because the Faram set actually weighs slightly less than the set that I'm wearing right now, the Vengarl set. So that may be something I want to consider. And these primal knights, very easy. Very forward focused attacks. They can lock themselves into combos fairly easily. It's just a matter of making sure that they don't hit you with any of their broad sweeping attacks, because those can kind of mess you up, especially if you're trying to loop around from behind, because they have extremely good turning radius. These guys are all really nice to kill. Single backstab with my blunt damage, as well as my ridiculous amount of iframes, just allows me to breeze through there. Honestly, I'm feeling like I should be missing half of these rolls just because I was so I got so used to playing on my Soul Level 1 character for a little bit right before heading on over to finish off the boss. And honestly, it's good training. Like, if you ever want to get better at Souls games, your best bet is to set yourself a challenge playthrough. Set yourself a challenge playthrough where you just stick to one theme or one idea or one challenge and maybe even just like one weapon or one set of weapons and I guarantee you that by the end of that playthrough if you stick it out you will be a master of whatever it is that challenge you set yourself was because you in order to beat Souls games you have to be good enough you have to be able to adapt you have to be able to use your weapons effectively use the use their movesets adjust how you're using them based on the enemies you're facing no matter what the souls will not give you victory you have to claw victory from its cold dead hands and that's what makes them so great it's so satisfying so fulfilling once you actually be a souls game every boss that you take down just gives you that little bit of rush of i did it yes because it is a triumph it's this is incredibly difficult and to actually do that, it's really, really satisfying. Some of my favorite ideas for challenge builds are sp like one weapon only, or no healing, low levels, etc., etc. There's a, there's a lot of really fun ones. 
I don't particularly like no armor just because I'm a slave to fashion souls, but that's just me. I have done it before, and I've done some variants where I can't use my left hand or I can't use my right hand. Back in Dark Souls 1, where there wasn't the concept of left and right hand ambivalence, where you could just use whichever one you wanted, as it is in Dark Souls 2, one of my favorite playthroughs that I actually had a lot of fun with was playing, uh, whatchamacallit, left-handed, using a really strong main weapon in my left hand, usually some sort of dex weapon, and uh, only using shields or daggers in my right hand. I did allow myself to use daggers for critical hits, but aside from that, it was all just shields and anything that you would stick in your left hand normally. It was really fun, especially once you reach about mid-game and hit in Orlando. Can I, can, I, can I grab that? Thank you. Because one of the best weapons for left-handed use is the uh, Silver Knight Spear. It doesn't immediately make you think, like, oh yeah, no, that makes total sense. But if you can learn how to use it in unlocked combat, just pointing your character in the direction you want to be swinging, or thrusting, rather... Its range and incredible base damages really allow you to just slaughter your way across Lordran. It's so incredibly powerful, and again, as long as you can use it effectively, as long as you can aim its thrusts, that range is going to carry you through. I was really surprised because once I'd grabbed that and upgraded it to about plus four, I think, was all I could manage without just buying a bunch of Twinkling at the time. Once I got it upgraded to that point, I actually managed to beat Ornstein and Smo on my first attempt. I was really happy because not only did I beat it on my first attempt using a left-handed character, but also without Estusing once. So it, it, that just really speaks to how versatile the uh, build was. Come on, I, I'm waiting for them to actually pop their heads up because... If you actually break off their head, as you saw me do to the first one, it actually means that they have zero chance to drop anything, and they have some fairly nice drops. They can drop the Stone Twin Blade, which is pretty okay. I mean, it doesn't fit into this theme, but it's a powerful and extremely quick strength scaling Twin Blade, so that's already pretty nice. But they also can drop the Luelin set, which is incredibly lightweight and very very strong defenses it just has absolutely zero poise and last but not least they can also just drop titanite slabs outright and until the DLC came around they used to be the best place to farm those not that you would ever really need to outside of like absolute end game when you can buy infinite chunks but the fact remains oh ow I'm playing so sloppy now just because I know that I'm pretty safe, but uh, I'll adapt in just a little bit. It's this feeling of power of coming from a really low level character all the way up to, oh, like, what am I, 126 or somewhere around there? It's extremely gratifying. And I know that going the other way is going to be incredibly jarring, but god, I feel so great right now. On my soul level 1 character, I already managed to clear my way through all the four great old ones, and actually was at a very similar location in the game to this. It's just that I've been a little bit stuck in Sholva. Not only are the... Have I just not even bothered heading towards the uh, gank boss fight just yet, just because I know they're going to tear me to shreds, but also I've had extreme difficulties... Just facing uh, Alana, I believe? Yeah, Alana, the Squalid Queen. Her summons make the fight just absolutely terrifying. No matter what she summons, even if it's just the skeletons. Having to deal with those three extra targets, if I can't just swap them all down in those first few moments, makes it absolutely terrible. Gives you an absolute terrible time of it, trying to face her while 
switching your target between the three and making sure no one's coming in range and you're not under threat from any of your angles is very, very difficult to do. And not to mention that her summoning Velstat is basically a death sentence. Velstat can crush you with very practiced ease and goodness. He just... It's a very, very difficult fight once Velstat gets involved. I'll, I'll just leave it at that. If he's swinging away at you, you, you know your time is numbered. And... Honestly, it is it is still really fun, but it feels kind of unfair. Like, the NPCs are at a distinct advantage just by the nature of numbers. And that's, that's extremely difficult to deal with, especially since I, I'm running a challenge build of Soul Level 1. It's like, goodness, how do you deal with that? So much damage. This is always such an annoying secret. Sometimes I've actually fallen off there trying to melee that branch down just because I didn't want to deal with uh, the lobable items, but I, I wasn't going to let that happen while I was recording. As you can see, you can sometimes get gypped of your animations depending upon whether or not there's something blocking you from walking in there. And while I get while they added that in, it's just kind of kind of annoying that they put that there. It keeps you from heading up ladders, and as you saw earlier, as because I accidentally turned a certain way when I was opening a chest, it still gave me the loot animation, but I didn't actually grab the item, so I had to waste a little bit of time doing that again. It's not a big gripe, but it's, it's definitely there. Like, you, you can't say that that's non-existent. Oh, that's, that makes me happy that I can stagger these guys. The Archdrakes are incredibly powerful and so if, if you can stagger them and especially if you can get the first hit as you saw me do then y you may just have a chance of of kind of surviving intact because they are incredibly powerful enemies and if you're not going in at full strength you're probably going to get wrecked especially when it comes to facing them in numbers which you're going to have to do in several occasions. Probably with a little bit of covering fire from the mages in this level later on. Especially because they set the most evil ambush possible right before a bonfire, just because that's how From likes to play their games. And believe me, From is playing games with you. One look at this level should tell you that just outright From does not want you to come out of this alive, or at least sane. They kind of want you to come out of it alive, but hollow at the end of it. They want you to know that they killed you, and they killed you a lot. I think they kind of have a very sadistic mindset when making these games. And, of course, anyone playing, myself included, has to have a very masochistic mindset when playing them. So, I think it complements itself rather nicely. It's a vicious cycle. But I'm not really complaining, at least right now. There are a few things I complain about, as I'm sure you've heard by now at least, but really, for all my complaining, Dark Souls 2 is a masterwork of a game. It, it's incredibly impressive mechanically. Like, it just fixes so much that was wrong with Dark Souls 1. Like, the durability mechanic being absolutely useless. The combat's been shorn up. The... Weapons are incredibly more diverse. The Titanite system has been made more manageable. There's there's so much that's better that sometimes we just kind of forget about it while we focus on the little details that are worse, like the actual story and some of the enemy designs and a lot of the level designs. But it there's a give and take. I wouldn't say that it's necessarily a better... You know what? Maybe I would... I'm I'm going to say that I wouldn't, but a case could be made that Dark Souls 2 is a better game than Dark Souls 1, and I can say for certain that you couldn't say Dark Souls 2 has a better story than Dark Souls 1, but at the same time, I can also say for certain that Dark Souls 2 handles better than Dark Souls 1, so 
it it really depends on where you place the value in your game and while I am incredibly story driven at the same time I play Dark Souls for playing Dark Souls the immense weight behind the combat the fluidity there the real dynamic fighting the weightiness the satisfaction you get when you come out ahead and so I, I can't really discount the mechanics in this game it's very difficult for me trying to compare the two different souls because that's really what they are they're different neither one is necessarily better than the other but they're both so good and I guess it really just comes down to which you played first with what's more nostalgic whether you're in it for the lore you're in it for the gameplay or what have you whether the little odds and ends that are wrong with Dark Souls 2 stick out more for you than the things that are right or what it, it, it very much is a personal choice whether or not you like Dark Souls 1 or Dark Souls 2 better and I've seen a lot of hate and a lot of hypercritical mentalities been focused on Dark Souls 2 recently and I, I, I can't really agree with those I think that it's a very ex incredibly enjoyable game to play and I wouldn't play it if I didn't think that it's definitely worth the money I spent and the time I've spent on it and I look forward to what more I can do with it it's really great once I get my strength to 50, that puts me at level 140, which gives me just enough to increase attunement to 13. If I want to be sticking below the 150 soul cap, and I think I'm gonna. Like, this character I might want to actually take into PvP once I'm done with this playthrough, especially because it's a very fun theme build. I don't like doing non-theme builds in PvP. I mean, I'm not the best, but I'm not the worst, and so it makes me feel a lot better if I can win playing with a gimmick or some sort of cosplay. So even if I lose, I can say that I just had fun playing the build, and if I win, I feel especially gratified because I know I'm not min-maxing my character all the way to the umpteenth degree, like so many that you can find around the PvP scene in this game head into the Brotherhood of Blood arena and just get ready for a parade of level 300, 400 characters who really just have the absolute scummiest outlook on PvP. Lots of dual spears, lots of katanas to really just no end. It's just so much. This was a really fun secret that I found the first time I was heading through here. And when I picked up this weapon, it made an immediate impression on me. And while I've kind of learned to hate it now, the Helix Halberd still remains one of the coolest weapons that they made in the game. It's certainly one of the silliest, but I, I really like its design even for its silliness. And while I don't think it's viable in PvE at all, and I think it's extremely toxic in PvP. I, I really do like how it looks and the unique uh, animations that it has that makes it a really cool weapon, even if, again, I don't actually want to see it in use. Let's see, what do I got here? I have got to back it up. Mm, there we go. Come on around behind. Ah. This can be a little bit difficult because he doesn't use his regular fighting AI when he's out of max range of his uh, leash location. And so sometimes it can be a little bit more difficult to lock him into this sit down. As you can see, the first thing he does when he stands up is takes a few steps back towards his spawn location. Because at this area right here, he feels like he needs to leash back. That's what his AI is telling him. And once he reaches just within proper leash range, he is ready to fight again and can sit backwards on me, whiff horribly, and just give me more damage. But if you catch him on the edge like that, sometimes his AI can act a little bit wonky and he can start using his regular attacks when he should be sitting down and 
it makes him a little bit unpredictable. Which I suppose is something that either should be lauded, or maybe FromSoft didn't even think of it and it just kind of happened. But either way, it makes it a much more interesting fight than most of the other ogres that you can actually face. As you can see, that little priestess there was really nice and dropped a twinkling titanite. This entire area is an incredible place for farming that if you need more than the DLC offered you. <laughs> As you can clearly see, I, there really is no end of things I can praise about the DLC. The DLC even fixed the problems with special titanite, giving you just incredible amounts of both twinkling and petrified dragon bone. It's like, what more did you want, people? It, it really hypes me up for what we're going to be seeing out of the next two DLCs that I've got coming my way. Because really, if, if you sat me down to write a wish list of what I could have wanted from the DLC, it would have been better bosses, better level design, more Titanite, and some really unique weapons to mix up the game. And check, 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 we get all of that from the DLC. So much is really there. I, I, I would go as far as to say that if you're going to pick up Dark Souls 2 ever, then y you really should buy the DLC. I cannot imagine a reason why you would have Dark Souls 2 and not have at least the Crown of the Sunken King. I'll consider the Crown of the Ivory King and the Crown of the Iron King when they come out, but right now I can tell you with complete and unabashed sincerity that the Crown of the Sunken Saint King has been one of my favorite DLC experiences ever, really. Oh, bollocks. There we go. Once you narrow their numbers down, the encounter isn't so bad, but they do have that little healing support back there who can really mess up your day if you've got one of them down to just a sliver left. She'll still just walk around and heal, but she has a chance to drop Twinkling Titanite, so I can't let her live. I have to have her drop. That's how it must be. They kind of fool you into thinking you're going to go for that drop, but really it's just right here, and if you step too far out, you are going to fall off the edge and just die. They're very tricky about the ledges in this area. If you're not carrying a torch, it can be incredibly difficult to actually see the distinction, especially if you've got your uh, brightness down a little bit, or if your TV has certain display issues. I know that the uh, one of the TVs I've seen my friend play on is actually terrible to head through this level with, especially for your first time, because it's almost impossible to see what's actual ground and what's just water. I am going to tag this bonfire here, but I'm not going to rest at it, because... I'm going to carry its torch all the way back to uh, the level a little bit back there because there's one little side secret that I have the ability to pick up and didn't my first time through. There's an Estus Shard as well as a Miracle Sunlight Blade back there that I want to grab just because they're there and I don't have them, I'll be honest. Since I picked up the Estus Shard from During Lake Castle, I'm already going to have my full 12 Estus next time I visit Majula and actually remember. So I don't really need it for that. But there's also a Soul of a Brave Warrior, if I remember correctly, hidden among these ruins here. So there are a few things to come back for. Let's see, it should be over there. Come on up. I really should have grabbed this coming through the first time. And no, it's a Fire Seed. Which, again, may be something I need, considering I'm going to have those extra points to spend. Again, the best ideas for them would either be Vitality, Vigor, probably not Endurance. And I, I guess, again, I could bump my attunement all the way up to 13 and give me a, myself a pair of spell casts. I really wish I could remember how many spell casts Flame Weapon took, because I think that would be the most ideal way to fill those slots, but if it's anything like, uh, what should we call it? No, I think it might be okay. I don't, I don't know. I'm going to have to look. 
but then again, that's also a New Game Plus boss soul, so I'm not going to have access to that for quite some time, unless I want to actually go back and ascetic that fight, which is honestly a terrible idea. That is one of the boss fights that you never, ever want to have to redo. Ever. It's just terrible. It's, it's wonderful the first time, but in all the new game cycles, the Lost Sinner has a pair of pyromancers that join her, and it just turns the fight into an absolute mess. It takes away the really clean, focused, forward gameplay that the Lost Sinner had, and replaces it with just a completely chaotic, ramshackle fight of just running around trying to control the pyromancers, avoid their just spamming of abilities, and also dodge your way around the Lost Sinner, who is out for your blood with a complete vengeance. Replete with bonus health, bonus damage, and if you will to just mess your ass up. It is, it is intimidating, to say the least. Can I kill these guys with a strong attack? I wonder. Now that I've killed one of them, I can back off and kindle her is going to be... Oh, he's here. He sees me and he wants me. The best idea is to run immediately back once you've brought Kindler up because he's going to try and rip your face off with his own little bunch of sorceries and hexes. And as you can see, he's got actually quite the powerful array. Why he bothers to stick behind that shield is beyond me, but I'll take it. Now I can come back out of here again and begin dodging these Shrine Maidens. I don't know if I discussed it while I was heading through the level proper, but the best way to dodge any sorts of magical attacks like theirs, especially without dodging, is to... Well, I did dodge there, but that was because... Oh! There we go. Is to just walk completely perpendicular to the direction it's coming in at. Even when you're you doing the slow walk of walking through water, uh, it will allow you the spell to completely whiff, and it saves your stamina for fighting or rolling when you get trapped into it, either because you're avoiding some other sorts of damage, using your actual attacks, or what have you. It's just a really nice way of not having to use stamina to avoid the damage, especially because I know a lot of people have trouble in this location dealing with all these Shrine Maidens. And I, I can understand that. That was the Red Iron Twin Blade, and did we pick up any chunks? We did not. We are going to need to pick up a few chunks here and there in order to be able to have that at plus 10, because right now it can only hit plus 7, and who wants that? Especially when I already have two wonderful plus 10 weapons right here. So, that's going to be my next mission, but I'm pretty sure that Cloan will start selling those once I... Soon, if not already. I think that the trigger for selling the limited quantity of that is either killing Velstat, or it's killing uh, the Looking Glass Knight. I could be wrong, but we'll have to check, because... Oh. Before I actually head out, I am just going to grab that as well as the item on the little pillar back there. But after that, I believe that's all the enemies in this area, and I can head right on through to the final boss, who is a complete pushover. Honestly, he has about two attacks in his entire repertoire that can actually be considered threatening. And aside from that, it's just walk away when he wants to try hitting you, and walk back once he's resting from that. It's a very uh, silly boss fight. It's cool looking, but it, it feels like a failed concept because it is such an ineffectual boss that you're, you're really left wondering what the devs really intended with this fight. Because whatever it is they were intending, they did, they did not succeed. I have a, six, a sneaking suspicion, and it's actually based on something from... Japanese mythology, but I don't actually have the background to confirm or deny that, and even so, it doesn't make a very interesting boss fight. 
It's very bland. The boss looks kind of interesting, but at the same time, you could also make the criticism that it just looks disgusting and boring. It's an interesting idea, but again, it's... Eh. The bosses are not where Dark Souls 2 shines, so don't bother focusing on them. Just walk away. Oh, he's resting. Slash, 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 slash. Unload all that stamina. Oh, he's coming out of his shell. Now he's going to be resting. Slash, 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 slash. Oh, he's coming out of his shell. Oh, guess what? He's resting again. Slash, 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 slash. Let's see. Is he going to come out of his shell? He he is, guys. Oh, he's going to do something. Oh. oh, you see? That was one of his two dangerous attacks. The other one is where he actually shoots a jet of water in front of him because it's very poorly telegraphed. Right, bash, bash. Sometimes he turns that into a three-hit combo, so watch out. <laughs> and yeah, he just kind of is a flop. That's the best way I can describe him. That boss is a flop. Grab his wonderful loot and head on through. The one thing I will say is that they give you a kind of cool weapon for that fight. The key to the embedded. It's a complete joke weapon, but it has the really nice greatsword move set. And it while it can't be upgraded, it was just buffed in the most recent patch. So it it, it is a fun weapon to use. If only for really gimmicky fight club type builds because take this out into the open fields of PvP and you are going to get your Estus handed to you, but if you're going up into against another player with a Keyblade, it's it's kind of just a fun weapon to wield, especially because the reward you get for giving it up isn't really worthwhile. Like There's nothing particularly special for, about the rewards you can get from the uh, Mana Shrine over there, so I wouldn't... In, unless I specifically wanted something out of there, like the Manslayer, and even then you can get that without uh, without releasing the Milfinito back in Drang Lake Castle. So, I don't know. It's just a fun weapon. It, it really exemplifies the idea of joke weapons that kind of make their way through Souls games. The Puzzling Sword, I'm just going to mess around with because I'm waiting on the elevator. It's a cool weapon. Funnily enough, it can actually be used by Soul Level 1 characters, because while you're going to get really crap damage out of it, it still has the 6 dex requirement that is so important for Soul Level 1 characters, as well as only needing 7 strength. So, if you ever get the hankering to use a really interesting kind of long-ranged weapon, you can use its two-handed strong attacks as a really long-range thrust on your Soul Level 1 characters. It's just an interesting weapon that you might want to pull out every now and again. Maybe if you want that little bit of extra range. I can see certain cases where it could actually be extremely useful, like dealing with certain NPC phantoms, because I, for one, had an absolute horrible time facing Jester Thomas on my Soul Level 1 build. I just barely managed to face off against him, and honestly, he, he's more difficult than most of the bosses at Soul Level 1. I had extreme difficulties with him just because of how fast his animations were, how little stamina I had, how little damage I had, and how much poise he just had for absolutely no reason. That's my 50 strength. And let's see if Chloan has anything worthwhile to give me. She does not. Huh. Well, that's disappointing. Maybe she will after Velstat, but no guarantees. It might be all the way up to Ancient Dragon. No matter. I will do what I can while I'm here. I believe it should be near the bottom, but I don't actually know where the Twin Blade would be. There we are. It really weirded me out when I saw that it upgraded with regular Titanite, but I decided not to question it, just because it really seems like a weapon that would upgrade with Special Titanite, like, 
if you compare it to the Hide Lance, the Red Iron Twin Blade really seems like it would be something that upgrades with Twinkling. But, you know, once again, I'm not going to complain. It benefits me in the end. Here we come to the Undead Crypt. Something that always made me kind of curious about the Undead Crypt is that the Crypt Warden Agdane doesn't actually care if you kill his Grave Warden brethren. It's a little bit strange. It, it, it just kind of makes you wonder, like, what kind of guy is this? That uh, if you bring fire or any sort of light source into his crypt, he just throws a complete hissy fit, but you kill his friends, I mean, as long as you don't, as long as you don't bring any fire. That's, that's the really important thing. I mean, this is a really annoying fight. This is basically what PvP is like, if you're unused to high level PvP. Just so you know, it's just spells everywhere. I kid to a certain extent, but it is ridiculous how many spells come out just because people have the levels for it, in addition to all of their melee equipment. So, it, it can get pretty ridiculous. Especially in the arena where everyone just spams everything. <laughs> Good lordy. There are some really fun fights to be had, I'm not going to lie. But, at the same time, it really just makes you... It makes me, at least, a little bit salty about all the really toxic players that are just there to get the Covenant rank, and even once they have it, just there to get more wins. Never really understood that, but... Eh. God, now one of the dogs is barking. Hopefully you can't hear it too well, but... Eh. Go through all Agdane's dialogues. The insulate armor looks really cool. It's a very cool looking crusader type armor. But I think the imperious armor... You know, I'm going to shut this window one moment. There we have it. All solved. But at the same time, it just kind of leaves something lacking. It feels a bit too clean for the kind of look that I would expect. And so, I don't really think it all that worthwhile. Just learn his gesture because I'm here. He has nothing important for me right now, but if I talk to him later, he will actually have something quite nice. He will fork over all of his equipment, as well as his dark drift, which cannot be acquired any other way if I'm not mistaken. Just gonna get the stagger off on him. Give myself some breathing room. There we are with the wrap around, and we're almost halfway there. I hope that the uh, hammer that I have here will be enough to take out the statues in only three hits, but I cannot be guaranteed of that, though I can hope. Wait for him to be done with that. Come in, two hits for the stun, and three hits for the kill. It's really nice. Sign gauntlets. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Uh, a while ago, I was helping my friend farm for Cyan gauntlets. Well, for the full Cyan set. And we actually managed to make the Cyan stop spawning in his world. At the end of the Undead Crypt, we'd killed them so much. And yet we could not, for the life of us, get them to drop the Cyan Gauntlets. They would drop every other piece of their gear, from their halberds, to their swords, to their armor, everything except for the Gauntlets. And so, every time they drop the Cyan Gauntlets now, it just feels like a little bit of a slap to the face. Like, really? Really, now you're gonna give it to them, Mike? Be that way. Come on down here, because as much as Agdane doesn't want light in his little tiny room, he doesn't mind if you bring light to the rest of the crypt at large. So, come down here, light that off, and now you've spread fire throughout his domain. Whatever shall he do? The answer is sit tight in that little room, because he doesn't really care about the crypt at large. It's just his little area that he's concerned with. Get another soul vessel for all of you people out there who want to respec this late into the game. I'm sure there's plenty. Let's grab this, Soul of a Hero, 
and it has the courtesy to dump you off right here at the bonfire. Isn't that kind? Now, while it does do that, it also drops you off at the bonfire right next to a room of hostile enemies and infinitely resummoning hollows and ghost mages, but, you know, don't look a gift horse in the mouth. The one annoying thing about this level is the, uh, just multitude of these tombstones that, while they're very simple to just destroy and kind of move past, they block your way for that first little segment of trying to clear on through, and it's a little bit annoying, because they will come back if you ever die or homeward bone out. That's one of the chunks, so now you only need three more. That's good to see. Oh, completely lock on fail there. These guys are kind of annoying, but you can make sure you never have to deal with them again if you simply take the precaution of destroying their spawns. Oh, there we are. As long as you make sure to do that on all the rooms you're clearing for you, you shouldn't really have any difficulties as well as you can skip most of the enemies in here by just running right over here and heading up the ladder. This also allows you to kill this little lady before she causes too much trouble for you, unless you <laughs> hit her off the edge, at which point you'll have to deal with her a little bit later, right after you grab this. This is the first location of the dried fingers, and so you kind of have to come at least this far if you want to be hosting PvP in your own world with any measure of regularity because otherwise you're never going to be able to get enough uh, time in the vulnerable zone because the way summoning works is I mean the way invading works is they kind of put you on a list and so whoever's at the top of the list gets the next invasion and every time you get invaded, it kind of bumps you all the way down to the bottom of the list. However, you can kind of override that by using the dried finger as kind of a way of telling the system that you want to be PvPing, and it will take that into account and bump you up. It will undo the, basically the timer reset that keeps you safe from invasions for a little while, so even new players who can't deal with invasions at all, they still have a chance of going throughout the level unmolested just because every once they've been invaded once, they kind of have a little bit of a safety timer until they can get wrecked again. And after a nice little regime of doing that over and over and over again, they'll finally get good like the rest of us and be ready to come into their own in PvP hopefully paying a little bit of homage to those who came before them with a little giant dad cosplay here or there. Just something to remember us by, I suppose. I like to kill these spirits before I deal with these two just because they kind of annoy me. Knock three times, and they will finally... Oh, no, 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 no. I do not want them to just be batting me about back and forth. You really need to manage your distance with these two because their hits are going to stagger you no matter what. Like, these are not lightweight enemies. Oh, got Orma's Great Shield. Oh, because I actually have 50 strength, I could dual wield their Great Shields if they deign to give those to me, but uh, we'll have to see if they're that kind. This is just one of my least favorite encounters in the oh god least favorite encounters in the game just because there's so many of these mages and they just don't stop spawning because the little zombie hollows keep ringing the ah oh, I ran the wrong way too let's see if I can just I'm gonna run out of here and come back once I've rested at the bonfire no I'm, I can kill this one while I'm here there we go want to just wreck as many of those as you can before you just run on out because honestly I think running is the best strategy there you don't want to face five mages coming five of those ghost mages coming at you all at once when you could just 
bugger off and face them again once they've been thinned down a few. Especially because their statues won't regenerate even when you die or rest at a bonfire. So it, it really sets you up to have a much nicer time down there if you just kill a few statues, come back, kill a few more. It's, there's no penalty to you, and your weapon's going to be reset. You can just walk in across the shortcut you've already activated, and it just really removes a lot of the risk involved with this encounter. And that's what Dark Souls is about for the most part, is limiting the risk factor as well, maximizing your own benefits. Come on through. Maybe there's one more. Well, that's the bell. So is it down here? Yeah. Oh, mucked that up, but it's okay. Here we are. This encounter is a little bit tough on your weapon durability, but so long as you're being smart about it and only fighting when you need to and making sure to kill the statues, it shouldn't be too bad. Now, you can tell by the floor that there's something behind that wall. But they're a little bit tricky in that it looks just like this, except for this one is an illusory wall, while that one is a ferrous lockstone wall. How they really expect you to tell the difference by looking at them, they don't. They just kind of expect you to wrap a tap A against both of them and see what works. Also behind this wall is a little bit of loot. That activates that and will give you great lightning spear as well as Olenford's staff? Is that what it is? Yeah, Olenford's staff. It's one of the better catalysts if you want to be mainly using sorceries but also casting utility hexes because the staff of wisdom, which is actually the best for sorceries, doesn't allow you to cast hexes at all. And so there's a little bit of a trade-off there. It's it allows you to still keep the massive sorcery damage if you are just gonna not be bothering with hexes at all but still allows you to get those utility hexes which can be extremely useful like say you have a fair bit of dark damage but want to be using mainly sorceries like homing crystal soul mass uh, crystal soul spear heavy homing soul arrow is actually one of my personal favorites in PvP. But say you also want to be using things like uh, Dark Weapon, which I think is incredibly useful. I've had a lot of luck with the Silver Black Spear lately, and Dark Weapon really pushes the damage on that a little bit more than it would otherwise be. I was expecting that hit to sweep properly, but it did not. Let's see, I'm just kind of abusing my rolls now that I can actually roll worth a darn. And while it's not particularly skillful play, god, it feels so good to have that freedom to just roll whichever way I want and know I'm going to be safe. Really, really makes me happy. Especially because even when I get hit, my armor, because it's so ridiculously powerful after all those tight twinkling titan I pumped into it, is actually doing a really good job of conserving my Estus even though I'm playing sloppy. I'm gonna run right on through. Make them whiff. Get the stagger. Whiff. I want you to whiff. I want you to. Fine. The range on that is deceptive. It looks like it's. God, I just wanna. I just wanna shield break. Is that too much to ask? Oh, and it gives me the backstab. Whatever, I'll take it. Still gets me the kill. Sadly, even if you shield break these guys, you can almost never come in for the shield break repost. I don't know what it is, but something about how they actually take the hit to their shield kind of disallows that. Come on around. Rolls. There we go. For some reason, it likes to give me the backstabs after they're basically dead, so... I'll, I'll just take that as a sign that 
the game wants them extra dead. Finish him off. I kind of brushed past it, but that hollow under the stairs there, really important to take him out, otherwise he's going to constantly be ringing that bell. I haven't put two and two together yet. Ringing those bells summons the uh, little ghosts out of their gravestones, and there's actually gravestones in four specific locations along this path that, while they're indestructible, will continually summon little devil spirits ad nauseum. Just going to buff up because we've got a particularly difficult fight right here, and I just want as much damage as possible. But I think I can do it with just eight Estus. Velstat proper this time, not the mock-up that... Oh, bollocks. The mock-up that Alana brings to bear on you. Oh, those rolls. It's completely wasting stamina, but so much iframes. Ah, oh, it's such a relief. Really, it is. Oh, come now. Now you're just being mean. Here we go. Taking me a second to kind of get back into the roll of things, but here we are. This should send him buffing. Yes. This is going to double his health and damage, basically, but it gives me plenty of free time to just swing away. So, feel free. What? That shockwave came out extremely long after that swing was already over, so I don't know what was up with that, but that's Velstat for you. If you have an incredibly powerful weapon like this, or if you're just <laughs> really, really leveled for this section of the game, you can clear him without difficulties. One of Shandalot's manifestations here, here to guide you onwards. I think it's fairly well established at this point that that's not actually Shanelot, just one of her illusions that she kind of sends around. It is arguable whether or not you meet the legitimate Shanelot anywhere, but hmm, who can say? It's one of those really questionable bits that they haven't really established yet, like, where is Aldia? Or what exactly are the four great old ones referred to that the souls... Fendrick built this land upon. Those are just such ambiguous lines that doesn't really give you a whole lot to go off of. Hmm. I've got... I could take attunement. Yeah, I think at this point I'm just going to pump attunement because I have nothing better to do with the stats. Oh, that's interesting. Once I do that, I can actually soul vessel down and take a few points out of adaptability because attunement does actually give you a few points into agility and so since I don't need any more agility past 105 I can just reduce my adaptability by a few points and redistribute those into actual combat stats that are going to help me out in real fights as opposed to just kind of sitting there looking pretty as part of adaptability though technically if you want to be persnickety then Adaptability does increase my resistances and poise by a little bit, but it's it's not worthwhile. That's not what you get adaptability for. Now that I've... Did I grab the ring? Tell me I grabbed the ring. Yes, I, I did grab the king's ring. I got a little bit worried there. The king's ring is an interesting item, and there's a lot you could theorize about it, but I think that Pariah Dime Shift actually has it the most spot on, and I think that he has really, really great interpretations of the lore in this game. He's not perfect, like, I don't agree with everything he says, but more than enough of it to make it, oh, worthwhile to recommend him. I think his entire theory on the King's Ring, as I just said, is in incredibly well thought out, and really explains a few bits of lore that really are kind of ambiguous. Like, why is the King's Ring here? How does it work? What are these doors? Why is the Lord Vessel sitting in the basement in Majula? It's a lot of really interesting questions that maybe don't have an answer, but quite possibly do have an answer, and 
quite possibly a damn good one if Brydime is to be believed. So, let's head on through here. Take a look at the little insignia upon this door. See if you can make out any figures or any sort of theme pictures, maybe. I'm not going to paint it out for you, but Pariah I'm sure will. And I'll, I'll actually throw up an annotation and a link in the description because, honestly, it's, it's some really good lore. He pumps out a lot of really great stuff, and I, I really think it worthwhile for you to check him out, especially if you're actually interested in the lore of Dark Souls 2 to any great extent. I know I, for one, certainly am, but that's not what this playthrough is about right now, so I'm not going to go too far in depth. These guys, while being extremely weak, have the benefit of numbers, as well as having petrification. That being said, it's also extremely worthwhile to route them all, because they can drop really rare and powerful weapons, as well as uh, a few strange hexes, I believe. I know for a fact that they can drop some of the Black Knight's weapons, as well as a few hexes, so... Something to consider if you're just wondering why they were put in there. It's kind of strange that they would do that, but it's one of those parts of the game where you just don't read too much into what items someone drops. It's not really important. It's just kind of the dev's way of handing an item to you in a certain way. Because if they want to hand something to you repeatedly, they can't make it a drop. And so, well, they can't make it a, just a drop on the ground like that Twilight Herb over there. They actually have to make it an enemy drop. And so that's kind of one of the best ways they have for managing that. How's oh, this is This guy right here is the precursor of the Drake Blood Knights. Not quite infinite poise just yet, but he has that animation canceling, and he does actually read your inputs. So, kill him with extreme prejudice while you can, before his horrible evil brethren from the DLC come your way. DLC is great. It's not perfect, people. Still... Still has this. Oh! This encounter, I love it. Look at that. Look at that. They think you're gonna rush for this item over here, which I'm totally gonna grab. Look at that. That is a cool introduction. I was so sad when the skeleton faded away. I really wanted it to just stick around forever. But no such luck. I'm not gonna bother with. Navlan over there, the royal sorcerer, just because I don't have... I'm, I mean, I'm not hollow right now, and so he's not going to actually give me any sort of useful quest. Not that I could do anything with any of the things that he's going to give me either, but uh, just for consideration. I messed up the backstab being a little bit too overzealous, so now I just get to throw him around a little bit. Their AI just gets so wonky when you take them on before they're actually fully in the world. So, you take that to your advantage if you're ever having struggles with these guys, because, really, they will just sit there for you. Once they spawn in completely, you can get a legitimate backstab, and they will take the damage from that and probably be staggered. Oh, not gonna give me the kill shot? How about now? Yes. Just have no fear, and they will fall before you. Northern Ritual Band Plus Two. The only thing interesting about that is all the rituals that were going on in Aldia's Keep. Uh, I don't think that the ring itself is really worth anything unless you're going full caster all day, every day. There is no reason to even consider that ring. It's going to cut your HP practically in half. Maybe just completely in half. I, d I don't actually recall just because I never use it. Paying HP for more uses is just a silly idea, especially when you can get the Southern Ritual Band Plus 2 from Ascetic King Najka's fight, and that will give you three extra attunements, not just extra uses on the spells that you already have attuned, so... Unless you're using very extremely rare sorceries and miracles and hexes and pyromancies, 
especially ones that maybe have very limited uses like God's Wrath or Forbidden Sun. Don't ever bother with that just because it's completely worthless. He's nice and backs up for you, allowing you to swirl around. Uh, now he's in a little bit of a frustrating spot, but as long as I manipulate it properly, I should be able to use my iframes to get out of that. Yeah, we're, there we go. Drag him over to an area where I can still fight him while he does his little sit-down tantrum. Gonna have to come over. Still worth it for the hit, especially because it keeps him locked in this little pattern, and now he's in the middle of the room where I can just wail away on him with no recourse on his end. He gives you the drop. Yes, the Dragon Acolyte Mask. Just gonna show it off because it's one of my absolute favorite bits of Fashion Souls in the game. Doesn't necessarily go with everything, but it has quite a few really good pairings, and I think it just is such a good-looking piece of armor. My absolute ideal Fashion Souls that I go to with a lot of my builds just at one time or another is that Dragon Acolyte Mask, the Lady of White Robes from the Ladia magicians that we fought in the Undead Crypt, as well as the Throne Defender Gauntlets, and the Archdrake Boots. I'm going to end this episode fairly soon. I think I may have gone over time a little bit, but it's been a really fun episode. It's really been engaging, so I don't think I'm going to be complaining too much. Hopefully you'll manage to sit through it all right. We come again against one of these really large basilisks, but it's the same as the first one. I didn't bother stocking up on any poison throwing knives, and they're not in my inventory right now, so I'm just gonna deal with him the old-fashioned way. Drag him into locking himself into animations, and then just bash away from behind. There's nothing down either of these side alleys, so either down there or up here, so there's no point in heading down there. I'm gonna head to the bonfire and then just immediately quit out once I've made myself safe and repaired my weapons. I think that's fair. Especially because the bonfire is basically the hub of this second half of the level. These wonderful, wonderful men hiding behind these back paintings. And I get the bone shield, which, while a complete crap shield looks so amazing, with the fashion souls I just described. If you're going for weapon fashion souls in addition to armor, then you get to add the bone shield and the mannequin knife to the aforementioned setup, and you just look like death incarnate. You are coming for somebody's soul, and you're going to leave with it, by golly. Such an amazing looking setup. Oh, I think I may have come too far. I've definitely come too far, but not an issue. I can just head right back down this hallway. Not deal with any of these guys. Doorway should be right here. Come on through. Clearly someone is having a bit of a difficulty with that lime Gatorade, but who am I to judge? Grab the lockstone. Grab the secret door. Right behind here is boom. Bonfire. Light it up repair everything, and that's the episode. Thank you so much for watching. It's nice to be out of the DLC, but yeah, highly recommended. Have a good day, everybody.